All right, good morning. Welcome to Calvary San Mateo. So glad you're all here. Look chipper, excited, ready for church, all right? It looks like the sun came out outside, fantastic. I know it was cold and gloomy this morning, and we started this morning in worship. There was like three people in the room, and um, but we're not here for any of you or any of us. We're here for the Lord, amen? So we want to gather together. Uh, in, in, in this house, in this place that God has provided for us to gather as the church. Uh, we know the church is not a building, uh, but it's where we gather. And we, the people are God's church. And we are one small part of that in the midst of the global international church. And so it's exciting. Nothing uh, I'd rather be a part of than God's church, than what God is doing on the earth. So this morning, uh, we are continuing our series uh, through Faith and Culture, this Faith and Culture series. Hopefully it's been good. Uh, we took a break last week as we wanted to take a Sunday to talk about the international church, the persecuted church globally and worldwide, and kind of tap into that and hear about that and, and pray for that. So we got to, to pray together. It was, it was wonderful. Hopefully you've been praying about that throughout the week. Um, and just that you would remember the church uh, our brothers and sisters across the globe when, when you pray, when you seek the Lord. So uh, we are continuing this series now, um, looking again at purpose, looking again at the topic of purpose. So uh, Albert shared on purpose, uh, he, sh he shared on purpose, on purpose, uh, uh, two weeks ago, and it was fantastic. It was wonderful, awesome way to kick off the series. Um, and so that's on our YouTube, but that was, that was wonderful. And, and so looking at purpose again, I want to dive back into purpose because there's so much to say about purpose. Why are you here? Not, not here specifically maybe in this building today, but why are you here? Why do you exist? Why are you on this planet? What is your life really about, Right? Everyone needs a purpose. We were, we were made to, to know great purpose. And God has made us and created us to know purpose, to know him and purpose. And it depends what perspective you have on the topic, what your worldview is on this topic of purpose. Uh, there's many worldviews out there, but uh, we, everyone has one. There, there's no one without a worldview, without a way that they view the world. And so um, there are certain things we can agree on, certain things we can't agree on. And some things that we could agree on are, uh, are humor. And so I looked up the, the top two-line jokes. There's uh, the 50 top two-line jokes uh, voted throughout the world. Uh, a census, the, the largest census that was taken of the most popular jokes that have ever been, two-line jokes, to keep it brief. And uh, starting at 15, I'm not going to do all 50, but starting at 15 was, why should you never date a tennis player? Because love means nothing to them. Working in a mirror factory is something I can totally see myself doing. <laughs> How do you find Will Smith in the snow? You look for the fresh prints. We have a genetic <laughs> predisposition for diarrhea. It runs in our genes. What did, what did the pirate say when he turned 80? I am 80. <laughs> so some of them might take, take a second. I am 80. How does Moses make his coffee? We should, we should know this one, right? He brews it. I tried to catch fog yesterday, missed. <laughs> Someone stole my Microsoft Office, and they're going to pay. You have my word. <laughs> How many Germans does it take to screw in a light bulb? One. They're efficient and not very funny. <laughs> hey, take that personal. <laughs> Six, my grandfather has the heart of a lion and a lifetime ban at the zoo. <laughs> um, someone stole my mood ring, and I don't know how I feel about that. 
Uh, four, parallel lines have so much in common. <laughs> it's a shame they'll never meet. My wife accused me of being immature. I told her to get out of my fort. <laughs> Number two, uh, interesting, and the Lord said unto John, come forth and you will receive eternal life. But John came fifth and won a toaster. <laughs> And the number one voted uh, was, I told my wife she was drawing her eyebrows too high. She looked surprised. Okay. <laughs> so some things we could agree on, some things we can't on a global perspective. And that's uh, what we're going to look at three points this morning about this topic of purpose. Three points that are going to help us look at purpose. And of course, through this series, we want to look at what the Bible says about these topics, what it says about these issues, the intersection of faith and culture. And purpose is a huge topic. It's a huge topic anywhere you go. Everyone's searching for it. Everyone's wondering about it. Right? It's in the air. It's, it's something that everyone knows they need to really drive them to do something significant or be a part of something Significant. There's a universal longing for this thing called purpose. It is a buzzword, a, a buzzword in our modern world. Purpose and meaning. What is your purpose and meaning? Uh, recruiters try and give it when they're uh, talking to recruits about jobs or going into some certain industry or or what do you want to do with your life if you're younger, thinking about what college you want to go to and the things that you want to aspire to be. Well, what's the driving purpose in your life? Businesses try and focus on it as it's the number one thing for retention to keep someone engaged and producing at work. You have to give them a sense of purpose. They want to be part of something that has purpose and meaning. Philosophically, we've tried to uh, unearth what this purpose is. Where does it come from? Why do we think about it so much? What are the tenets of purpose? What's really holding it down? Does it even mean anything at all? Or are we just playing games? And so two weeks ago, Albert talked about four things that make up a worldview. And those four things are your identity, your origin, your destiny, and your purpose. Right? Your identity, who are you? Your origin, wh where did I come from? H how, do, how do we get here as a species, as humans? Your destiny, where am I going? What happens when I die? Wh where am I going in this life? What is, what is the point of all of it? It's so brief, it's so quick. And then purpose, why am I here? And I think we live in a, a time where many have disregarded a lot of these things. That they, they only have so much meaning that you can pour into it. But, but there's an underlying thought, there's an underlying prevalence that things really just don't matter. Things really don't matter. The more culture jettisons God from the picture, the more people get lost in the inevitable meaninglessness of life. Meaninglessness, like Thanos, is inevitable. It's inevitable without God. When God is removed from the picture, the, the meaning, as much as you want to pour into it, it's not there. But this is not what the Bible declares. And this, what we have to say about purpose is extremely important, that we are made in God's image, that all people are made in the image of God and have intrinsic value and worth. How beautiful is that? No matter who you're talking to, they have intrinsic value and worth. How many conversations I get into, whether I agree with someone or disagree with someone, I always back the truck up and say, hold, hold on. You're made in God's image. Let's just think about that. You are amazing. Though we may not disagree with things, let me, let me tell you my starting point, that you are made in God's image. And therefore, I need to care about you. I need to care about what you think. And I want to help you understand where I'm coming from and, and what the scriptures say, what God would have to say about this life. C.S. Lewis aptly put it, he said, um, I have a slide for this. He said, if minds are wholly dependent on brains and brains on biochemistry and biochemistry in the long run on the meaninglessness flux of the atoms, 
I cannot understand how the thought of those lines should have any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees. That if there is no God, if, if, if there is no heaven, if above us is only sky, then everything is just in flux and it's just going on and, and, and our brains are firing in a certain way and there really is no ultimate purpose or meaning. I listened to an interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson, of course, the, the famous physicist or, and he, or astronomer, and he said, I'm intrigued by how many people are searching for meaning. He says he gets letters upon letters, and of course he's talking about these big, vast uh, astronomical uh, things that just blow our minds continuously. And he says, I'm intrigued by how many people are searching for meaning. He said, we are literally stardust. This can give you a sense of belonging in what otherwise might come across in a cold and heartless universe. So he says he finds his meaning in just taking consolation in the fact that he's stardust. <laughs> and that gives him some semblance of meaning, but knowing that really this universe is, is pretty cold and, and heartless. And it's only what we inject into it that gives meaning. But the scriptures say that we were made for meaning. We were created on purpose. Our, your life has value. Every life has value. And every life is handcrafted, custom made to fulfill a certain purpose in God's plan. And that is a beautiful thing. And so we're going to look at perspective this morning is the first thing. Perspective of the purpose that God gives us. The perspective that we're not trying to fill up our cup with our own meaning. No. We are a little tiny cup being scooped into the ocean of vast meaning and purpose that we cannot even comprehend. So we want to look at the perspective of who God is. I remember when I first came to Christ that this was one of the things that struck me. Of course, I wanted meaning and purpose in my life like any 17-year-old at the time. And I wanted to know why I was on earth. And I wanted to, to know the big questions and have some answers for those things. And I was swept away with the understanding and idea of who this God is as I got to know God, of how big God is, of the perspective of who this God is. J.B. Phillips, he's an author of a book called Your God is Too Small. He says, we can hardly expect, expect to escape a sense of, of futility and frustration until we begin to see what he is like and what his purposes are. That, that we, we don't serve a small God. We serve a God who is vast, who is huge, who, who we can barely, with our brilliant minds, comprehend. Isaiah 40, 12 through 14, is a very good perspective-giving verse. One of my favorite verses of all time in Isaiah. It says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span? which is this measurement, by the way, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Love that. Which goes on this, this beautiful poetic prose of, of who God is. He's creator, and he's magnificent, and he's glorious, and these things are magnificent and glorious. So I wanted to help with our perspective a bit this morning. And one of the things that's always blown my mind is, is this, that they say when you look at stars and sand, when you look at stars in the sky and sands on the seashore, I'm going to give us some back of the, the napkin math here, stars. In our universe, known in our, in our galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy, there's 100 billion to 400 billion stars in our galaxy. And in all the galaxies, they estimate that there's 100 billion to 500 billion galaxies uh, in, the, in the known universe with, with roughly that uh, amount of stars, give or take. So when you calculate it all, on the low end, they say there's 10 sextillion stars on the low end. And the high end is 200 sextillion stars. And, and sextillion is is a, a, a one with, with 22 zeros behind it. 
It's, it's a huge number. It's, it's very hard to even comprehend what this number is, but all, it's a, a, lot of, a lot of stars in the sky. And so uh, she's hit next. We'll look at the rest of the math here. So I knew you'd love to see this this morning, uh, this, this scribble. This is, this is great. And so sand, when you look at sand, so the question was, is there, more, is there more stars in the universe than sand on all the beaches of the earth? And so I don't know if you've looked at sand recently. I have a penny here with sand on it. You know, just we know what sand is, right? Um, and there's probably a couple hundred pieces of sand on this one penny uh, that we have here. So we know the size of sand. And, and think about when you're on the beach, enjoying, enjoying the beach, or, you know, maybe not here because it's foggy or cold, but pretend you're on a beach where it's nice and you're enjoying it and you just look at all the sand. Or maybe you, you, you don't like sand and it's coarse and it gets everywhere. And, and you know, it gets in stuff. And, and so, um, but, but sand, there's a, there's a lot of sand on the earth, okay? Um, and I love this because it helps put in perspective just who we're dealing with here. So sand uh, is about a half a millimeter across, and there's uh, about 20 grains of sand in a, in a centimeter. And in a cubic centimeter, there's about 8,000 grains of sand in a cubic centimeter, like a sugar cube. Um, so on the low end of the stars, uh, 10 sextillion um, grains of sand. If you put 10 sextillion grains of sand in a ball, the low end of how many stars that we think there are, the radius would be about 10.6 kilometers. It's a big ball. Um, and if you do the high end, 200 sextillion s s pieces of sand in a giant ball, uh, you're going to get a radius of 72 kilometers, uh, which is, uh, I know we're not in uh, England, um, but uh, sorry, <laughs> this is the mathematician I watch. He's apparently British. Uh, but uh, so you're like, good, you didn't come up with that? Good, okay, I kind of trusted him. No, but uh, so that 72 kilometers is 44 miles uh, radius. So picture a ball of sand, 44 miles in, in radius is all the beaches uh, in the world, all the coastlines. So uh, that, that 44 miles away from here is what, San Jose, so that's the radius, so double that. that that's a big ball of sand. Um, and so then is there that much uh, sand uh, on the earth? So uh, if you take all the, the beaches, uh, they, the beaches have 700, oh, hello. This is too much math, apparently. Uh, <laughs> 700 trillion cubic meters of beach are on the earth. Uh, this has been estimated by various mathematicians, uh, which would e equal five sextillion grains of sand. And they could be off by two, so maybe two, or you know, maybe three sextillion or seven sextillion uh, grains of sand. So uh, three to seven, and the estimate of stars is 10 to 200. So uh, the conclusion is that there's likely five to 10 times more stars in the, sky, in the universe than grains of sand on the earth. I mean, just let that sink in for a minute. There's more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches uh, on the earth. And uh, here's a kicker right here. Okay, so we're dealing with grains of sand. So if you took a single grain of sand, which I have one right here, you can see it. Oh, it's off. There's another one. All right. So if you took a single grain of sand and, and you wanted to uh, know, if you're curious, how many atoms a single grain of sand has in it, a single grain of sand They've said, there's the math over there. It's a little confusing, but it's, it's too early, uh, <laughs> honestly. Uh, a single grain of sand has more atoms in it than there are stars in the universe. So there's more stars in the universe than grains of sand on the entire, all of the Earth's beaches, but yet one grain of sand is made up of more atoms than there are stars in the universe. That's amazing. Just what kind of majesty are we dealing with here? So let's look at Isaiah 40 again. Helps us put it in perspective. When thousands of years ago, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah wrote, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked off the heavens with a span? And again, a span is this. Just to give perspective, all those stars to the Lord of glory is a span. Who has enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure? And weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has 
measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows in his counsel. Right? What, a, what a perspective shift this gives us to how big and how vast God is. Romans 11, 33 through 36 says, Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Right? If you let that sink in of, of who, what majesty we're dealing with here. Oh, the depth, the riches, the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Surely this, the scriptures know who they are talking about. They are talking about the, the Lord of glory. Even when they were penned, we are just beginning to understand the ways of this world. One of my, uh, another wor- verse I love is Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. It says, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. You understand that? You've got to understand it by faith. That the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. I love this verse. I think this verse has many implications. I've done a lot of study on this verse. And and, and it's speaking that God created everything ex nihilo from nothing. There wasn't like scrap material laying around and God's like, oh, I'm going to use that to build the universe. No, there was nothing and God created everything ex nihilo in, the, in, the, uh, in Genesis, in the Hebrew. Out of nothing, God created something. By the word of God, he did it. By his very words. So that what was seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now this could be in the first instance talking of God who is not seen, made everything that's visible. But there's also commentary about the things that are seen are not made out of things that are visible. Everything we see, we now know, is not made out of things we can see, right? Everything we see is made out of things we cannot see. It's made out of atoms and planks and quirks and all those things that we we can't see, even with electron microscopes. So the perspective of who God is, this God, all things made for him and by him and for his purpose And I love this, and and in light of this, of who who this God is and how the Word of God speaks of the Lord. Uh, One of my uh, beloved quotes uh, from Robert Jastrow, he was a NASA scientist, author, and futurist. He said this, at this moment it seems as though science will never be able to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. It surely is a mystery. Isn't it beautiful? He says, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak as he pulls himself over the final rock. He is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. As the the, the Bible speaks and how complex it is and how it speaks of who God is, these Farmers from 2,000 years ago, as people will try and derail and, and blaspheme the scriptures, that is not God's word. It was written by goat herders. Look, they wrote of things that we are now discovering are true in our day and age. It always speaks with accuracy and authority. So God is big. Perspective, God is big. You are very small. Right? You're small. It's good to, to get out in nature and do that game. Right, Stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, which I was finally able to do. I've been wanting to do it for so long because I would always preach about it. Like It's like you know you're small when you stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, but I'd never stood at the edge of the, edge of the Grand Canyon. But now I've stood at the edge of the Grand Canyon. So now I can say when you stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, your wife will be like, get back from the edge. Okay. Well, just, that might also happen. But another thing that will happen is you just you feel very small, very, very small. That God is big, he is eternal, he is amazing, he is good, and he is glorious. No wonder Psalm 8, 3 through 4 says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? You ever look up and just, you know what? What is my life? What, what, What is my life in light of that? 
Remember before I knew the Lord, I, I've sh- shared this before with youth, but before I knew the Lord, um, and, and just God was working in my heart and my life, and I was just wondering and really searching about why I was existing on this planet and what I could possibly do, what, what my life would possibly come to, all these things, and but yet it's so brief. Does anyone even really care except my mom? And, you know, it was just like all these thoughts. And, and I remember I was trying to grasp for meaning before I knew the Lord. And, and uh, <laughs> there was, I don't know if you remember the movie Armageddon. Armageddon, Jerry Bruckheimer movie, fantastic. Um, Hans Zimmer did the, the score. But at the beginning, it, it shows like this zoom out from the earth, you know, and just how small we are. And this asteroid streaking through there. And I remember uh, with the help of, of some substances <laughs> sitting there just like, and then going out into a field and looking up and just being, being in awe and wonder about what I was beholding, what we were a part of, that we can even start to comprehend the, the vastness of God. And yet we are so small, yet we are so small, we are included in God's massive purpose. And the second point is that purpose is personal. Purpose is personal. That God transcends all this, all this glory of who God is. He transcends that and he cares about your life. God cares about each life. He has a purpose for each one. Psalm 139, 17 through 18 says, How precious are your thoughts toward me. Toward me, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. Think differently about the sand now, right? I awake and I am still with you. The psalmist is saying, it's like a dream come true. I awake and I'm still. I wasn't just dreaming that God has a purpose and plan for my life, that God cares about the affairs of my life. I wasn't just dreaming when I thought that. I woke up and it's still true. That's awesome. That's what the psalmist is saying. You ever have a really, really good dream, really good dream? You, you wake up, you're like, oh, man, I'm back here. <laughs> you know? He's saying he has the best dream, the greatest dream he could ever have, the greatest thing you could ever dream is that there's a God who loves you, a God in heaven who has purpose for your life. But guess what? You never wake up and are dissatisfied because that's not true. Because it is. Because it is true. God has purpose for every life. John 10, 14 says, I am the good shepherd. This is Jesus speaking. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. In Christ, your life has great purpose. In Christ. Listen to that Jesus, the Son of God, God wrapped in skin. I am the good shepherd. I know the names of my sheep. I know each and every one. And how do we experience this great purpose? How do we plug into this great purpose that God has? Well, it's in Christ. It's to know Jesus, to give your life to God, to surrender to the God who made you and the God who bought you, to confess your sins to him and trust in him. In Christ, all these promises become yes and amen. And that's how we experience God's great purpose for us. Is we need to be in Christ. We need to know Christ. We need to follow Jesus. Matthew 16, 24 through 26 lays out this counterintuitive thought for us. It says, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone, I love that, if anyone, the, the invitation is open, it's to everybody. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? What will it profit? Or would you give away one of your eyes? Would you sell an eye for a million dollars? Would you sell both eyes for two million dollars? No, you wouldn't. So think about your soul. The eye is the gateway to the soul. How much more worth is your soul that you would know God? 
Or is it profit if he gain the whole world and forfeits his soul? Sometimes we talk to people who hear the gospel, hear about God's love for them, that God has a plan for them, that Jesus died for them. They say, that's nice. Not for me. And I think of this verse sometimes. What does it profit if a man gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Well, you better gain the whole world then. You better live it up. A lot of people you talk to that, that don't want Christ, that reject God in their lives, they're not even gaining the world. They're not even gaining much. Like Jeff Bezos, maybe he has somewhat of an argument, but still, it's, it's no comparison. But most people, they're not, not even there. They're struggling, they're hurting, they're depressed, they're struggling with this or that, and they're still rejecting the goodness of God in their life? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? There's great purpose. People struggling, looking for a purpose, looking for it and everything, trying to make it, trying to, I'm, I'm a bag of stardust. That gives me purpose, I guess. I don't know what a stardust. Is that even good? You know, and, 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 and they're trying to invent this purpose in their life, but still feeling, feeling meaningless and empty and depressed and full of anxiety and worried about the future and all these things where God is stepping in saying, look, I have great purpose for you. I created you and I love you and I have purpose for you. Purpose that you can never even comprehend. Look at who God is. And then insert yourself into that story. Where are you? You're gone. You're, you can't even tell where you are anymore. But you're in part, you're enveloped in that story, and God knows where you are. God knows what part you're going to play in that vast story that he's writing. And it's beautiful. And Revelation says that when we see the redeemed fall at his feet, we won't even be able to count the numbers of people that are going to be worshiping at the throne of God. And that gives me great joy and great hope that many would come to know Christ. And this is how we do it, is that we deny ourselves, we take up our cross. He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, a lot of people want to want to find purpose in their life by seeking after purpose. But you never find purpose by seeking after purpose. You find purpose by seeking after that which is worthy and good. And nothing is as worthy and good as Christ. Nothing is as worthy as that. If you get lost in that story of serving God and pouring your life into him, guess what? Purpose will find you. Or you'll get swept up in purpose. You don't have to be scrounging around seeking out purpose in your life. This is how it works. So whoever would save his life, for whoever would save his life will lose it. So those who are trying to Keep a hold of this life and clutch onto everything, though they know it's passing and fading and the time is going so fast. What's happening? What's happening? They're going to lose it all. But Jesus is saying those who lose their life for my sake, who give their life to God, God, it's all yours. Here's everything I got with an open hand before you. God, it's all yours. Those who lose their life for God's sake will find it, will find true life, Luke says in his gospel. They'll find true and abundant life in him. So you don't find purpose by searching for purpose. You find purpose by in giving yourself to something worthy. And only Jesus Christ is worthy of everything. Only Christ is worthy. We all know we could find, that's why people do find purpose in things that are good and honorable. We're celebrating Veterans Day tomorrow. How many found purpose in what they were doing and what they've done in, in military and trying to better the world and trying to protect those who are somewhat innocent and do right, right? There's purpose to be found in that, but it's secondary purpose. The greatest and glorious purpose is only found in Christ because he is worthy. I think it's why so many struggle with purpose in this day. We have no great struggle. We have no great war. We have no great things foisted upon. We have nothing foisted upon us that needs us to rise to the occasion of, of greatness. We're, we're drifting a, a about in, in so much abundance and in, in so much. And that's where meaninglessness is found. But listen to me. God has purpose for you. And it's not through seeking the purpose. Don't seek the purpose. Seek God. And the purpose will fill your life. It will fill your life. And so the last thing is that it's perfect. That the, perfect, the purpose God has for you is perfect. 
Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Right, that God's will for you is perfect. As messy as it may seem from time to time, it is still perfect. His will for you is perfect, and you test and you approve it. You live this life out. You trust in him. You have your mind renewed, and you walk in that. James 1, 2 through 4 says, count it all joy. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let's let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In both those verses, the word perfect has always been somewhat of a mystery to me. How could, how could we be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing? Well, God's will for us ultimately is perfect and, and will end in perfection as it slides into the eternal state. And his purpose for us, though, the whole time is, is perfect. His purposes for us are perfect. And as an artist, sometimes... I'll do a, a, a work, and this has happened many times as a very flawed artist. So this is just an analogy, but I'll do a, a, create a piece of work, and you just get into it as an artist. You get into what you're doing. And oftentimes, you'll look back at it, you'll look at that piece of art with very much scrutiny <laughs> as the one who, who made it. But you'll look back, and so many times, as I've created a piece of art, there will be a, a misstroke or there will be a, a smudge or there will be something that is, I would think, imperfect. But when I look at it as a, at a fi in a finished product, I'll say, what I thought was imperfect there, that, that fits perfectly. That, that thing, in fact, if I try to recreate it, that's when I have the trouble because that imperfection in the moment turned out to fit so well with what it became, with what the, the final piece came. And many times I could think of a piece where there was a smudge here or something here. I was like, ah, at the time that wasn't in the rehearsal. But then I looked at the finished product later and I said, wow, that, that actually adds so much to that piece. And so God, who is the ultimate creator, the ultimate artist, you can look at your life and you can think there's so much imperfection, there's so much hassle, struggle, there's, there's so many things I would do differently if I was the boss or in control of everything, but God knows best. He knows best. And some of those imperfections or things you might not understand now, God in Christ, if you know Jesus this morning, if you're living for Christ this morning, he sees all those things, and they're perfect, and they will come out perfect. And so I could say verses like this, to count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Because these things are working something. The testing of the faith is working something. The steadfastness and perseverance is working something. And it's working something that's perfect and will be complete, lacking nothing. So Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the purpose that you give us in Christ. Lord, you give so much. And Lord, I pray, Lord, if there's anyone that doesn't know you this morning, that has never given their life to Jesus Christ, that they would this morning. Because that's where purpose, ultimate purpose is found. in this life, and in the next. Lord, I pray that no one here would, would be the one trying to cling on to the things of this world, the things of this life. 
that are fading, the things that are passing, the things that are transient. And we know that. We, we know they are. And Lord, you said who lo- whoever loses their life for your sake will find it. Will find life now, abundant life now, and eternal life forever. And Lord, I pray that that's where our purpose would be, that we would give our lives to you, Jesus. That we would recommit our lives to you, Lord, if that's what we need to do, God. That we would look at all the things in our life and take inventory. Lord, as we sing these songs, as we close this service, as we have the the communion elements, God, that we would take inventory of this brief moment of time that you've given us. Here we are, not promised tomorrow, just in the midst of so much expanse around us as we're on this spinning planet. God, there's just so much going on and so much changing and who even really cares about us and what really even matters. Why am I even really here? God, you answer all these questions with glorious, glorious truth. Lord, the truth you give us is incomparable. Lord, then you give us yourself. Lord, you give us your spirit to confirm these things, Lord. You give us your spirit, Lord, to to walk with us through this life, to fill us, to move us forward. So, Lord, I thank you. I praise you, Lord. I pray this all in Jesus' name.